Hello, and thank you for joining us for Designing the Future, How AI Transforms User Experiences and Interfaces. Produced in collaboration with the Internet Culture Specialist at Garbage Day, this webinar investigates how AI can help you create customer experiences that are high on value and low on clickbait novelty. Garbage Day's Ryan Broderick and Parton Sums Leila Wu share the conceptual framework and accompanying principles that will ensure your UX and UI make the most of AI. Stay tuned till the end for a Q&A that tackles some tough questions on how to navigate all the newness. Let's get started. Before I pass the baton to Ryan, and he's going to talk about kind of the what's happening in the world of AI today, I thought it's best that we start with some introductions, because not all of you might know who Pardon Some is and what we're doing together. Um, Pardon Some is a strategy agency. We really think of ourselves as a customer experience company. Uh, we work with a lot of companies, big and small. These are some of our recent partners, the more recognizable ones. Um, but we really bolt on to your team and we work to co-create, transform, innovate experiences. And the way we do that is really seeing through the customer's eyes. So that's really important to us is understanding the customer and um, seeing customer first before we head into any projects. Ryan probably doesn't need much of an introduction for this crowd, um, but he's the founder of Garbage Day, which is an incredible newsletter. I've been a subscriber for some time, and you just get a treasure trove in your inbox of amazing, wonderful, and weird knowledge of the web. These days, a lot of that is AI because that's what's happening right now, and it's just an incredible. He's very much immersed in the world and when I see things on garbage days, when I see it like everywhere else the day after. So it's great to have him here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> Some of the things we do together and we do really well, like we started this partnership because on both ends, we really understand people and we know how to understand you as a cu customer, but also understand your business and how to take those trends and insights that we find into actionable initiatives that a business and a brand can use to really grow. And we understand technology, we know it's moving crazy fast and we can help you get ahead instead of feel like you're racing to catch up. Um, we started this partnership several months back. Um, some of you may remember last fall, we sent a survey out to garbage day readers and we asked them to plot recent tech trends on a hype cycle, like a Gartner hype cycle. So we wanted to know what's up and coming, what's maybe at a hype, what's in a slump, and then what's maybe headed towards mainstream. We came back with some really interesting stuff like binging Netflix is so 2020. These days, it's all about your episodic releases and we're having succession watch parties and we're talking about it through the week. Um, short form video, we're all watching YouTube, we're not even on Netflix, Nielsen just released that data. Um, short form video is really very much now, not just in our phones, in our bedrooms, also in Congress. Um, and we are all interacting and using dark social every day, but not too many of us know what that is. Um, so all of these insights that we took from the survey, we put together into a future of tech forecast with some ideas for brands and businesses on what they can do with it. You can still access that report if you want. You can scan the QR code. Um, I highly recommend it, not just because Ryan and myself put it together, but because it came straight from your eyes, ears, mouths, you know, what you guys are seeing. Um, and um, the topic of AI at that time was already kind of peak hype and we couldn't really um, dive deep into it in one report only. So we had an in-person event. If you were in New York in February, you may have received an invitation to this event. Um, we had a AI artist, Maury there, who um, had a really cool demo. We had a panel with Adam from OpenAI and Alice from Recollect. And we really dove into that topic of AI and what is the future of generative AI look like? How can we make the most of it without losing our souls? One of the big takeaways from that event was that, you know, we had the technology in GPT-3, this vast potential of technology, but it wasn't until that became a chat GPT that it created the right tone, that it had that user experience that made it so accessible for everyone. 
Um, and that's what brings us to today and kind of what we want to talk about. But hold up for a second. We got to step back and we got to get ourselves there. So I'm going to pass it off to Ryan. And he's going to talk a little bit about what's happening in the AI space, how rapidly things are changing and moving, and what is going to be that iPhone moment for AI. And then I'll come back. Sorry, you'll have to listen to me talk again, but I'll talk about what that means for brands and businesses and then how we can take all of that information and have a sort of have a framework that people can really hold on to to be able to feel confident when they experiment in this space. And we're also going to save time for an audience Q&A. So save your questions. If you have really burning questions, you all, you guys already saw that Q&A bot. So you can ask questions in there. And we have team members who will be able to answer live. Um, or you can wait because we'll, we'll make sure we have that time with you guys. OK, go ahead, Ryan. Hello there. Uh, if I have anyone in here who's also in my Discord right now, uh, send me uh, a Garfield emoji in the Discord. Uh, say hello. Um, so we're going to be talking about the iPhone moment for AI, and that can mean a couple of different things. But I think because we're talking about something that is largely software, like no, I don't think anyone in here is interfacing with AI via hardware at the moment. Um, it's a little different than the way the iPhone rolled out or the smartphone era started. So for, for, for our sake today, we're going to be talking about convergence and how these um, play, to, play together and how we interface with them. So to start, let me just give you an overview of, of sort of the main products here, the companies involved. So we have Microsoft Bing, which is running right now, I believe, off of chat GPT-3 or 3.5. We have... Chat GPT, which is run by OpenAI. It's sort of, it, this one has a knowledge cutoff of 2021, I believe still. And then we also have Google's Bard, which is the experimental new interface that Google has launched. And these all kind of operate the same thing. You can talk to them. It responds. Um, they are not sentient. Um, they sort of operate more like an autocorrect uh, where they are trying to uh, put in the next word of what you would be wanting you know, so they're, they're, they're very reactive. Um, Bing is connected to the live internet, so it can act a little wonky. And the term for that uh, wonkiness is hallucination. So that, that's important. We'll be bringing that up later. So we jump to the next slide here. Um, we're going to be talking about visually generating AI. So Midjourney is the one that you've definitely encountered probably in viral tweets. It's on version five right now, and it's, uh, it's a lot better than it used to be. Um, we also have Adobe's Firefly, which is uh, in beta, and it's it's the first sort of attempt at bringing generative AI into a an app ecosystem. And then we also have Runway, which is the responsible for possibly saw the video of uh, Will Smith trying to eat spaghetti that uh, is bouncing around the internet right now. And that has some pretty amazing features like the text to video function. So uh, if we go. To the next slide, you'll see some recent examples. This is Mid Journey, I believe. Uh, it looks like it. Um, and this is different users imagining Donald Trump being arrested. Um, and I think these images are really useful because they have a lot of things in common with most AI art. So I find that most AI art puts the, uh, the, the subject in the center. So tr Trump is dead center in all these photographs. Also, AI art, it's a little hard to find to, to, to kind of train your eye for this, but I find that it's very orange and blue saturated. And, and the theory is that it's because it's trained on movie posters, and I can't really think of anything more blue and orange than Donald Trump being arrested by the NYPD. So that's a pretty useful for the color palette we're talking about here. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we're now going to be talking about everyone's obsession of the moment. Balenciaga Pope. Uh, once again, though, you still see this sort of like orange and, and blue effect. It's center focus. Uh, also, uh, but there are some tells this was generated by AI. There's some fuzziness uh, sort of around the Pope's body. And uh, he's carrying a Starbucks cup, uh, which I assume the Pope would not be doing in real life. Also, I, this was pointed out to me, and I, I hadn't really thought about it. You never see the Pope hold anything because he's the Pope. He doesn't have to hold things. Uh, so there's there's kind of a, a, a dreaminess, an uncanny valley dreaminess to a lot of this work. Um, and I find that 
if you can start to kind of train your your eye for it, you can see it. But this stuff is also evolving so quickly that the tells that we were using way back aren't really accurate anymore. As you can see, uh, his fingers look almost normal. So th th these things are, are evolving really, really fast. Um, I want to talk about how we chain these together, how we start to use them for creative processes. The best example, but it's a very controversial example, is on the next slide here. We'll play a little bit without the audio. So this was created by a YouTube channel called Corridor Crew. I'm sure you've seen it. But for those of you who haven't, what they did was they took reference images from a 90s anime called Vampire Hunter D, loaded them into a custom library, then trained that library to generate stills of their originally shot footage to look like that art style. Um, and there's like an entire behind the scenes um, kind of breakdown of how they did this. It was controversial because they took stills from a, an existing anime and basically trained a AI to copy its aesthetic. Um, it almost looks good if you if you don't really pay attention to it. Um, uh, you know, if you watch it on your phone, it looks okay. But like, I'm sure right now it doesn't look great, especially with the, the connection, it's moving a little slow and you can kind of tell that the AI is not exactly perfect, but it is better than it should be, I think. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we're gonna be talking about GPT-4 now. This is sort of the next stage in this stuff. So this was released by OpenAI. And uh, the major takeaway is that it can see. Um, if you show it images, it can react to those images as if they were text inputs. It's not great. Um, even in the demo that OpenAI released, it um, it gave a very bad recipe for French toast and it can't identify certain things, but it is still very powerful. And I think for people who are trying to figure out how to use this stuff creatively, it's a whole new toolkit. Um, you know, the, the, the robot has eyes now. Uh, it can also do a few other uh, pretty impressive or frightening things, depending on your definition. So if we go to the next slide, we can see a screenshot here. Uh, the GPT-4 was tasked with solving a capucha. It realized it couldn't. So it hired a human task rabbit. Then it lied to the human task rabbit about why it needed help. Um, it's, it's downright unnerving. Uh, but I think it's a good example of sort of uh, how creative these things can get. Uh, and then this is a recent example on the next slide here. Uh, Twitter user reported that he put his dog's blood test results in GPT-4 uh, and it was able to analyze them coherently and then offer several possible diagnoses. And then he took those diagnoses to a vet and turned out one of them was what GPT-4 thought was happening, which... Um, I like the I like this use case. I think it should be taken with a grain of salt. And I think it is obviously reliant on a lot of human intervention. Like this is, you know, it it didn't diagnose it completely. It offered some ideas and then humans had to kind of vet it. But I think what I've seen this technology do best is manage large amounts of data and sort of compress and summarize them into something that you can read easily. And I think when we're thinking about using these tools in a creative process or any sort of professional context, that's probably the mindset I would suggest having, which is that this is a very fast, dumb assistant rather than this is like a, a thing that can destroy human creativity. I don't think it can do that yet, but it's pretty good at speeding up some stuff that, you know, I don't know if I could look at a dog's blood test results and understand what they are, but this thing can sort of, uh, but it also has to be checked because this stuff hallucinates quite a bit. So uh, if we go to the, the next slide here, this is sort of the last piece of the puzzle as far as I'm concerned. So Eleven Labs is an audio AI tool. It's what you're seeing generate all of the, the deep fake audio of different celebrities' voices. Um, they had they have some serious moderation issues that they're trying to work on. Uh, and they I, I feel like they've opened a real Pandora's box, but uh, you know, there's no real turning this stuff off now. Um, and it's pretty good. Uh, it requires a lot of audio to get like a good AI clone of that voice. But if you are a newscaster, a podcaster, uh, you know, someone with isolated singing vocals, the president, people, people have kind of built a fake Joe Biden that sounds, I would say possibly more real than the regular Joe Biden. But uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's really impressive. And I think the, the last thing I want to end on when we're thinking about the convergence of this stuff and how it all fits together is another Balenciaga generation. So if we go to the next slide, it's Balenciaga, Harry Potter. Um, 
in, if you haven't seen this, the audio is what you would think it is. It's Harry Potter characters as AI clones talking about being a model for Balenciaga. But I think it's a really useful idea of where this all sort of heads at once. So this is, uh, I, I haven't totally reverse engineered how this was done, but I'm fairly certain this is mid-journey uh, image generation animated with another AI, voice acted by another AI, put it all together. Um, and I think this is also a useful one for the people who are sort of afraid of how AI will impact human creativity. Because I would say this is one of the most creative and clever things I've seen on the internet in a long time. It's also very funny. Um, and I think when you're trying to wrap your head around what these things can do, I think it's also useful to point out that like this is clearly AI art. And based on what I've seen from audience reactions, that seems to be the smarter way to go, is to be like, this is a thing I did with an AI. And I had, and and this is the last kind of piece of the puzzle, I think, which is that this is something that could only be done with an AI. And if I think you're trying to gauge public reaction to this stuff, what, whatever you use the AI to create, I think you're better off making sure it, it has to, like it couldn't exist without an AI. Uh, Cause then I think people are a little more forgiving because I have to kind of reiterate one last time that this stuff is controversial and there's a lot of ethical answers that aren't, aren't answered yet. Um, and we're sort of in a wild west moment, which is fun, but it can, you know, it can be a little uh, uh, tricky to navigate. Absolutely. I, my jaw literally dropped when I saw this video and I think some of the audience members as well. Um, it's pretty remarkable how quickly everything is changing and moving. Yeah, it's uh, it's crazy. <laughs> that, that video kind of made me gasp. So yeah, it's crazy. Uh, given all of that, and given how everything is moving so fast, it's understandable that it'll kind of make you dizzy the amount of noise that's around AI. I mean, we were talking a few months ago, like oh, it looks amazing, but the fingers are so creepy or the AI doesn't have enough, the right amount of teeth. And then now it's like, we're talking about, well, compositionally, we've got subjects in the center and, and we're talking about color and like saturation of color. So it's like the progression is in such a rapid speed. Um, and there's just so much conversation on top of it. So it feels like we're the AI landscape is cacophonous right now because it's like every day there's a new tool. If you're like me, you open up your feeds and all you're hearing is about AI or the next expert in AI. I crack up when I see this meme. It's like the speed of light and then the people becoming experts in AI. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen the job descriptions where it's like 10 to 15 years experience in AI. And you're like, if you have 10 to 15 years experience in AI, you were building it. Um, so I think we're all kind of trying to figure it out. And then there's a lot of pressure on consumers also to like figure out how to use it. Um, and on the brand side, when we're thinking about businesses, um, business brands are rightly so, a little hesitant. I mean, Brian, you brought up like the ethics around it. There's so much right now that's being experimented and we're in this kind of watch and wait period, at least on the brand side. Um, when you think about like the iPhone app store when it first launched, there was also a lot of experimentation and hype and all the, uh, as many bad actors as there were good. You know, you had every app, it was like an I something, I beer, where you learn to drink um, on your phone. I French kiss, where you made out with your phone, which like post COVID sounds so disgusting. Um, my favorite was I am rich app. If you guys remember that, it was like the most expensive app on the app store. And if you um, were um, crazy enough to pay the price, you just got this like glowing orb on your phone. Um, so at that space of experimentation, all the value is being put on like, what's the price you can pay for it? If any of you guys were really deep in NFTs and buying crypto punks, this might give you some post-traumatic stress. But like anytime you put all the value on just what's the price you're going to pay for it or the value on the novelty of it, you're skating on really thin ice. So what we're trying to understand here is how can we get a little more rooted and have some groundedness in like solving real issues versus just being a novel experience? Like what is it going to take 
to be more of a transformative experience. Um, and you touched on it a little bit, Ryan, but I was thinking like I was, you guys have probably heard OpenAI now has an app store. So brands have been invited to develop plugins for using OpenAI technology and brands like Expedia are already experimenting with how to use it. Um, and then I was reading some comments and there was someone who was like, well, I went shopping in London for four hours. I was in South Kensington and Chelsea. I don't know if those were the neighborhoods, but they sound like cool London neighborhoods. And, and I didn't buy a single thing and I had the best time um, just walking around shopping. Why can't we get AI to do the things we don't wanna do like our taxes? Um, and yeah, it's true. AI is gonna help us in efficiency and doing menial mundane tasks. But there's also real things that we come up against in like normal shopping experiences. I'm not shopping in London all the time, but I'm online and maybe I don't want to buy three pairs of shoes because I want to get the right size for me. Or maybe I want to know what that item is going to look like on me before I like showroom that works for the brand and works for me. And that's like a problem, maybe a first world problem, but it's a problem that AI can really help solve at least in the brand space and in the commerce space. Um, so what are the parameters for that? What's gonna ground that experience? We know it's not enough to just slap on a chatbot. Um, Bing um, released their new version of search. I downloaded it, um, I uninstalled it just as quickly because it really wasn't much of an experience. You know, It was a regular search with a chatbot. We know it needs to be integrated, whatever AI experience we have, we know it has to be a seamless part of what's happening. Like Google Workspace, all those tasks that we're using already, whether it's like um, a Google Sheet or making a slides presentation, the AI should be a seamless integration into that to help us do those tasks better, more efficiently, easier. Um, that's table stakes. I think we already know that. But what is it gonna take is, and what we saw when we had that event in February was that opportunity for brands to really own um, is the user experience. And what is it gonna take to get like a GPT to something, GPT-3 to something that everyone uses that chat user interface, that chat user experience. So creating a designed experience is gonna break the AI out of the tech world into something everyone can use. And this is not exclusive to AI. We've seen it happen before. So um, ITA was a search aggregate for flights. You could use ITA or you could use Kayak. The consumer is always going to choose Kayak over the ITA because the experience is so much easier. It's so much easier to navigate. It's so much better of an experience, even though ITA was powering more than 40% of Kayak searches. Um, ITA sold for $700 million, Kayak sold for $2 billion. So there's a big gap um, between the meh and the mainstream, and UI UX can really bridge that gap, take you from the, that $700 million company to that $2 billion company. So there's real value, and it can make what is an incredible tool into a productivity goldmine. I asked ChatGPT to tell me the difference between itself and GPT-3. And GPT-3, even though it's much larger, more general purpose language model, ChatGPT can do my job for me. And this was literally me when I was like, oh, ChatGPT can do my job for me. Oh, ChatGPT can do my job for me. Um, we use it, actually, a lot of my team members, <clears throat> pardon some, use ChatGPT all the time in our daily practice. Why UI and UX? Because really it starts with that customer first with the user. Um, and that's what we were talking about earlier, what we think about all the time at Pardon Some. Marketers, a lot of times we think, oh, this would be so cool. Let's just make like a really cool experience. Let's just uh, do something that's like gonna stand out. But for it to have the wings to really fly, for it to be grounded in something um, that can really grow and have longevity and have people using it long term, um, there needs to be an understanding of 
what is it that people are looking for? What are their issues? What of their needs haven't been met? How do they navigate experiences? If you don't have that basic empathetic approach with what's happening with people, you're going to be out of touch. And I think a great example of that is Levi's recently announced that they're going to use AI generated models to incorporate diversity in the brand. Um, and it got a lot of backlash because we're not looking to see fake diverse versions. You know, I want to look and I want to see someone that looks like me. And I want to know that the brand supports diversity and inclusion by hiring real people that are diverse from many different backgrounds, not fake people. Um, so I think having that groundedness in understanding what are people looking for before you just create a new experience is really important for brands. So when you're thinking about integrating AI, you really want to think about what are the real problems that customers are having, and that's going to take you that one step above. So how do we frame that up and create like a good use case for a brand in AI? There's sort of three principles that's going to make a great experience. Um, it should be easy to use. So I don't need a PhD to be able to understand how to use this AI. Um, it should be efficient and let me do what I want to do faster in a better way. And it should be reliable. And maybe based on what Ryan just said, also transparent. Like we know this is AI doing it and, not, and we need AI to do this experience more than just the results are correct. And if you marry those three principles with what do my customers need and what's going to make sense for my brand to deliver on that customer need, that's going to give you like a solid holistic um, AI experience. But AI can't solve all of our issues, right? Yeah, well, not today, maybe in the future. Um, AI does some things really well more than other things. Uh, brands can use it operationally to streamline business processes, and it does that very, very well. Um, one example of that is Yum Brands that owns KFC and Pizza Hut. They acquired Dragon Tail Systems um, to improve their restaurant workflow system. So they have AI cameras that will tell you if the meat has gone bad, or you have um, AI can understand how much to order. So you reduce waste in the restaurant. So these are really like incredible solutions for your brand operationally. Um, but we haven't quite cracked the code on the consumer facing and how can we, um, what are the ways that AI, what are the things and the problems that AI solves really well consumer facing and how can we create parameters around that? So again, if we think of like our three principles and we marry that to whatever it is the customer needs, some of the things AI is really good at is trying on. I said it before, you know, like we do this all the time where we, you know, you want to see what things look like on you before you spend the money and you pay and you have to return things, visualizing things, planning trips, uh, planning vacations, whatever it is, searching, personalizing um, we've already seen that in search because we already had that linear process of you type something in Google, you get a bunch of websites, you have to open up tabs, you have to do your research very linear, linearly. And then you have now with ChatGPT, this customized holistic solution where I ask it a question and I have a full itinerary. We've also seen in personalizing, we now have brands making interactive dressing rooms where you get very personalized recommendations based on you and your body shape. And then you have um, a skin advisor that can look at my skin and tell me um, exactly the type of skincare solution that I might need. So it's very personalized to me. Um, and then we thought we would share with you guys today some prototypes and examples that we put together. We brainstormed. We thought, what are some great ways that we can solve the need of trying on, visualizing, and planning? What are some things that we can create using AI that's going to be cool and a fun experience that's going to hit those three principles, but it's also going to solve real problems? Um, so I'm going to switch over now to my Figma. So this first example is related to that need of trying on. This is for like a Nordstrom or think a retail, a fashion brand, 
right now, you know, when you go shopping and you're on online e-commerce, um, your recommendations are based on how you navigate on the site. I might click on a bunch of ugly striped sweaters and then all of a sudden I'm getting told to buy striped sweaters and I might not like striped sweaters at all. I might want to own like I follow influencers. I see the things I like. I want to be able to tell them what I like, the style I like. Um, AI can help me do that. I want to see what things are going to look like on me. AI can help me in that regard. So I'm on TikTok like I am every night, deep in a time suck, scrolling through a million videos. And I see this influencer that I always follow. And I always loved her style. I like how she accessorizes and I'd really love to have that look. It's not like I necessarily want to go on Instagram shopping and buy exactly what she's wearing, but I want Nordstrom to know like that's the look I want. Um, so I can click on my AI button here and I'm going to ask Nordstrom, um, I love this dress, where can I buy it? Or I might like this dress, but I want something knee length or maybe I just like her makeup or I love her jewelry. In this case, I'm going to say, I'm a, I love this dress. Where can I buy? Nordstrom finds me three dresses just like it. Um, awesome. I have a link right here. I can go straight to this Mallory Kalnick midi slip dress. It looks amazing. This is exactly what I want for springtime. The price is awesome. Free shipping. I love it. Except I look nothing like this model. Um, she looks amazing. I want to know what this dress looks like on me, and I want to try it on. Um, I'm also an influencer. I uh, have really great aesthetic. I love charcuterie and tons of selfies in my camera roll. I'm going to pick some of my selfies to upload to Nordstrom, and voila, I can see exactly that dress. I didn't want the cow neck. I want the V-neck. Perfect. Um, and I can simply add it to cart. So it's easy, it's efficient, um, it's reliable. I know I'm using AI transparently. I know it's the AI that's giving me that, vi that visualization, that trying on of what um, I'm looking for. I'm gonna move on to another example that we have. Uh, this is for planning. Oh, let's just do that. From the beginning, Walmart. <laughs> so if we're thinking, if you're like me, I don't know if any of you are parents, but you're probably, or working parents, you're probably always thinking about what to make for dinner or what are you going to plan your meals? And that's a <clears throat> real common pain point, something that we think about a lot. Um, I go, I might like pick up a recipe, go to the store, try and pick the ingredients, then I come back, but that doesn't help me. Like, how do I plan for the week or how do I meal plan? How do I make things so much easier in that whole process? So let's say I go on Walmart on my app and I want 30 minute meals for six people. I'm so sick of like going into Google and going through a million Rachel Ray recipes. Just give me like some really easy things that I can do. Um, and I get you know, my scroll of recipes. Uh, kids are not going to like my salad, pancakes they'll love, but I don't think that's right for dinner. I think I'm going to go for the chicken and dumpling soup. That's going to be a total win. Um, so I want my chicken dumpling soup, but I've got a bunch of things at home. I don't know what's the best step. What if I could just uh, send a picture of my fridge? Um, I really like condiments and canned fruit and processed meat. Does that make a chicken and dumpling soup? I don't know, um, but maybe I can just like send this picture to Walmart and uh, snap a photo and let them do the work for me. And they're gonna get, give me a customized shopping list so I know exactly what I need to buy. They'll also tell me if maybe I need some a wok or I need these uh, nonstick skillets and my cart is ready. And if I go to my cart, there I have all I need um, with everything that I have already in my fridge is the oil, the chicken thighs, um, maybe some baking powder and black pepper. I can have it delivered straight to my door and it's just gonna make my life so much easier. It's gonna make things so much more efficient. And it's that AI that's gonna solve that problem that I have. We have one more example to show you guys. Um, and this is in that, um, 
visualizing. So if you've ever like gone through the halls of Ikea, you're trying to get furniture for your home, you feel like really dizzy, like walking through every showroom space. It's really hard to understand like, what is that gonna look like in my home? How can I really visualize? Like I'm not a designer and I don't wanna spend a fortune. I don't have a fortune to spend, but I can go on the Ikea app and I can say, well, it's about time we upgrade the kitchen. So I really wanna try to see what my kitchen is gonna look like, but I'm not really good at putting things together. So if I try this Ikea experience, like this is my kitchen currently. It's, it's beautiful. Yes, my kitchen's very beautiful. It's not actually my kitchen, guys, but this is the kitchen, very beige. Um, what would this kitchen look like in a more traditional? A um, lot of cool textures here in the stone. Maybe I want a bohemian kitchen. That feels very cool, very blue, but this is it. This is exactly what I've been looking for. What I see all on Instagram is that beautiful white modern kitchen. Um, and it's so cool that I can see exactly what it's going to look like in my space. So Ikea will tell me how to build this kitchen. I can get a gas cooktop, which apparently is going to kill me in a couple of decades. Maybe I'll go with electric, but I want to redo my kitchen. And maybe I just want to add this whole room to my cart. And there I have all my products. The AI will help me find the task rabbit to go and install everything for me. And it'll make it so much more of a fun, but easy, efficient experience and solve all those problems I have. So these are not, you know, we chose these examples and we created these prototypes. They're not, you know, way out in the future somewhere. These are things that can be experimented with and thought around today. Uh, Ryan said, you know, the robot has eyes, the eyesight's not 2020 yet, but these are places that we can experiment that brands don't need to feel hesitant if there is that framework, if you understand what the needs are, if you understand what AI is really good at, and you understand hitting those three principles, you can really start to experiment in that space. So if you see through your customer's eyes first, you follow all of the like groundwork, then you test often and you experiment and we can help. So we're really good at doing that and helping you understand what are the action verbs for your business and the best cases for your customer. So that's where we're at today. And we have plenty of time for questions. Um, if any of you have a question, please don't be shy. You can raise your hand. Um, and we'll bring you up live to ask a question, or you can put it in that Q and A. Please. Um, I, I also wanted to just hit one thing because there's been a few questions throughout the presentation about this, and I realized that I didn't explain it. Uh, people were asking why is the AI generating Balenciaga so much? Um, so. Essentially, uh, over the last year or so, a lot of online communities, particularly on Reddit and in Discord, have been trying to reverse engineer what these AIs are good at generating. And uh, when they discover a prompt that works really well every time, they share it around and it becomes the new meta strategy. And for some reason, uh, <laughs> AI is really good right now with Balenciaga products. Um, I, I was able to to get it generating a bunch of stuff a couple of days ago. Um, and every time they sort of discover one of these new meta strategies, they add it to an ongoing list. So that's why you tend to see a lot of the same kind of generations traveling around is because people are experimenting with this stuff in real time. Yeah, it makes sense. And it's so recognizable, Balenciaga. It has such a like unique style. It's very easy to identify. So we had a question, do you think it's possible uh, to design an interface that can help to mitigate some of the risks of using generators, like setting expectations regarding accuracy, reliability, um, with warnings and education built into the user journey? Ooh, coming in with the hard questions, wow. Um, setting, ex well, you know, the AI is going to do what you tell it to do. So therein is kind of built in your expectations. Don't expect to get something other than what you're prompting. I don't know if Ryan, you have uh, more. Yeah. I mean, I've seen, I've seen some attempts at this. Um, Cause the, the, the issue is like, 
the AI doesn't doesn't think. So it sort of just spits back stuff at you, right? And so there are, there are ways to limit it. There's ways to sort of train it better. And from what I've been reading, the 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 new sort of phase of this, I think, the the sort of new arms race, is to create more limited, more specific, more niche use cases with this technology. Um, in fact, the, the anecdote I kind of go back to a lot is I was talking to a, a game developer who works in AI, and he was saying that AI makes a terrible uh, the generative AI is really bad for video games because it de- it doesn't stick to the script. It sort of just starts to hallucinate. And this was a problem with early on with Bing's AI as well. They've tried to limit it by um, shrinking the amount it can respond to you to a specific question. So there, there, there's a lot of people trying to figure this out right now because I think um, it's a really unruly technology at the moment. <laughs> so yeah, I think that the next step, step is to get it to, to plain eyes. Hence the future of Life Institute. We gotta get it to play nice. Um, we have another question here. Uh, the examples you gave are shopping for myself, where the data I upload to the AI is my own. What about experiences shopping for others like spouses or children? What are the barriers and opportunities for that use case? It's also a really great, great question because then you get into those ethics questions of what is it that I can share yeah, there's there's definitely all kinds of um, moderation guidelines rolling out in different platforms about what you can do with an AI and other people's pictures or images, um, and it's a it's a big area right now. Um, and right now, there's just ethically, it's a mess. Uh, and in terms of what you want to do, it's it's kind of everyone just doing whatever they want. And I think that's not going to continue much longer. I don't think it can. Right. Um, we have someone that wants to ask a question live, Michael. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Great, hi. Uh, Ryan, big fan, um, really enjoy this. Thanks so much for doing this. Um, I am exploring a lot with these tools and you know, the, the productivity piece is definitely there, but I'm really um, stymied, I think, by my ability to understand more deeply like how to, what my options are, how to, I craft good uh, prompts and I find that the more social media I look at the more I find that you know Steve Bannon it's like the zone is flooded with shit it's like so many people with these you know 10x your whatever and subscribe to me for a free whatever and and who is doing like amazing teaching around this right now who is and where are you finding like great examples other than like having to dive in and experiment for an hour and a half to like figure out one simple little thing. That's a great question. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, so because, because AI generation is so controversial, still a lot of traditional creative people aren't using it and they're, they actively are boycotting it. So trying to find people who are open-minded to it and not scumbags is really tough. Uh, cause like a lot of, as you said, a lot of sort of like, guys who pay for Twitter are are really excited about this stuff. And so I uh, I have found YouTube actually to be the best place for it. Um, one, because like it's a better format for sitting and watching someone do this stuff. And two, there seems to be a real love of the game for it. And so like the other day I was watching someone who figured out that GPT-3 can code in Unreal Engine. And so they went step-by-step step and made a bunch of video games in Unreal Engine. Uh, And they used art for mid journey and they did the whole process and it was really cool. They made like a game that looked like Rayman. Um, And so I think that's kind of my best advice at the moment is to, is to go where like the obsessive uh, fun nerds on YouTube, on YouTube are rather than the guys who are like showing off their new startup on Twitter. So we have uh, some questions in the Q and a bot as well. Um, Nina's asking, do you see prompt strategy as being a kind of IP? This is a great question. And it comes up all the time. And uh, as of last month, it can't be. Uh, the U.S. Copyright Office has met has ruled essentially that you cannot copyright a prompt in terms of like what it generates. Uh, 
It's the same issue as when that monkey took that selfie and no one could agree on who owned the selfie. Same deal with anything an AI generates. You cannot copyright it at the moment unless you alter it enough for the copyright office to decide that you have added enough human input that it's yours. So uh, there was a big push like six months ago for uh, like prompt artists to copyright their prompts and stuff. Uh, and it doesn't really matter. Uh, cause it, it, yeah, you can't. Uh, so what I would say actually is like, if you're excited about this stuff, I think right now is the right moment to start thinking about like, how do you use it to then as like a jumping off point rather than a final product? Cause as, as far as copyright and trademark go right now, you, that's kind of your only option for owning the material that comes out of this is by altering it yourself after. Great question. Um, Question for Ryan from Casey. What do you think is going to happen with our society and this technology over the next five to 10 years? Maybe we bound the best case and worst cases. I think, you'll, I think it's great. Uh, not No complicated questions at all. Just easy, smooth sailing from here, you know? Uh, super easy, great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I I think I think some of the things that we're worried about are really overblown at the moment, and I think some of them we're not worried about enough. I think, uh, based on what I've read, uh, the impact to our jobs is going to be slow, and then it's going to be all at once, and it's going to be weird. Right now, I don't see AI replacing a lot of industries at the moment because it, this stuff hallucinates; it gets things wrong; it can't it can't make complete images that make sense without human input. But I do think, like I know a data scientist who works for a large company right now, and, and as of six months ago, his team is just using GPT-3 at the time in everything they do. They have to check it, but it's already sort of fit its way in. And, you know, if I, if there's any programmers watching this, like I'm sure you're already, you've been using Copilot for weeks now, if not months. So there's, this stuff is kind of slowly making its way in and there will be a moment where it works well enough that you don't have to worry about it messing up. And then that will sort of, I think, be the, the big shift. Um, and then just to, to, to wrap, I just think, you know, you put your history head on and you look at the history of this stuff. I don't, I don't see like the death of creativity or the death of the human job. I think that like we're pretty adaptable, uh, but I think it's, it, you know, at a certain point you have to think like, what is the five-year trajectory of the thing you're doing? And, is like, is AI fast enough to replace it? And it can get kind of creepy when you start to think about that a little bit, but I think we're okay for now. Yeah, how could it replace human creativity? I mean, just like going for, how could it replace going for a walk outside and feeling the fresh air? Like, I don't think it's in that space. Um, so question from Ben, do you see GPT-0 equivalent programs cropping up for non-text media? or from a different protectionist angle, glaze overlays for text video? Yeah, I mean, at this point I have yet, like every time I think it can't do something, if like someone figures out how to use it, I think generative AI right now is the really hot thing that everyone's excited about. And I think we're gonna go through a period where we're just gonna try to fit it into any, any anything and everything in the same way we did with the internet and social media and all the rest of it. Um, and I think there's also that there was that I heard this for the first time, I think in like 2008 or nine, where someone said that like in the future, all companies will be media companies, which I think ended up being true for a little bit. And I think there's probably a possibility that like in the future, all companies will be AI companies until the next thing. And then, you know, and I think that's just sort of the way technology is moving at the moment is we all sort of like obsess over a thing, overdo it, put, peel back a little bit and then figure out the right ways to fit this stuff in. That makes sense. Yeah, it feels exactly like that Gartner hype cycle. We're like, just keep like shooting up to a summit and then there'll be a moment where we kind of like figure out how it gets, you know, acclimated into more mainstream. Maury, hey Maury. Hey um, Maury. So question from Maury, for brands that want to jump into AI but want to stay <clears throat> nimble, how do you plan for long-term integration of AI when the landscape is changing so rapidly? That is such a great question. Um, I mean, I can answer. On our end, what we see is like, now's the time when you need to be like laying groundwork and strategizing around those customer needs before you're just like full-blown developing a new product. So, and that's always the case is you wanna have like a clear 
strategy before you attempt to do anything. So I think that's where we want to be in that space to be thinking about it. That's how you stay nimble and you test things before you go out and just like throw it into the world. Uh, Brian, I don't know if you want to say more. I think that sounds right. I think, uh, I, I think there's probably a benefit right now to figuring out um, how AI fits into whatever you're doing. And I think it, it takes kind of a lack of an ego to, to do that, right. To, to stop and say like, okay, like how, how will, how will generative AI in, in particular fit into our company strategy or, or your, your own personal life. And then I think once you start doing that, it gets easier to slot in new developments because most of the stuff is evolving fairly literally and coherently. Like, you know, the stuff is just getting more sophisticated and more accurate and faster. So I think if you start thinking now, like, okay, what are some ways that we can improve what we're doing in natural and fun and, and valuable ways? And then you just add to that. And I think that's all you kind of can do to a certain degree. Um, question from Jackie, serious question. Ooh. Um, I am interested in the issue of transparency in terms of how brands use AI tech on their websites or apps. With the examples we saw here is very obvious, but already a lot of people are frustrated when we can't tell if we are talking to a person or a bot in customer service, et cetera, and it's going to get exponentially worse. Where's a discussion of this happening? I agree. It's going to get worse. <laughs> I, I just, I agree. It's going to get really bad. Um, and I don't, I don't see people talking about it, um, but I, I, I share your, your sentiment quite a bit. Right. And I think people, if anybody's talking about it, it's like reactionary, like the Levi's example was really great because people were like, wait a second, that's just, that's doesn't seem right. Like, uh, what are you planning to do? Just show us these AI generated models and expect that we believe you're being diverse. So I think people will bring it up naturally because of the frustration that we all feel. Yeah, there's some real serious big questions that aren't being answered and aren't really being taken seriously at the moment that probably should be around what we are automating and what we are replacing and the values that we we kind of communicate when we do that. And I have not found anyone sort of in the business world concerned with that. And that worries me. But um, I, I think those conversations are going to come. They're going to come real fast. The more people kind of dip their, dip their toe in. Um, let me just do a time check. Okay. Uh, question from Graham. Uh, who do you recommend following on Twitter to stay up to date with this space? Aside from Ryan Broderick. There are a couple good AI guys. Um, in terms of just like following the latest, uh, what was his name? Linus. Uh, is it a line it? Finding anything on Twitter these days is very tough. Um, but um, I'll... I'll try to send some. Uh, I'll, I'll try to include some accounts in, in the next garbage day and kind of send them around. But there, there are some. There are some good Twitter accounts, some good Substack people uh, that are all kind of keeping an eye on this. And I'll, I'll try to make a list. Um, well, that leads into the next question, which is: Is Twitter really the best place to stay up to date, or is it YouTube, Substack, Mastodon? This is from Isabella. That is a complicated question in 2023. That is a more complicated question than anything about AI. I, I don't know. <laughs> I just don't know. Um, a question from Marla. Uh, Marla, we kind of talked about it at the beginning, the open letter from uh, the Future of Life Institute. Um, I guess she just wants to know our thoughts. Accuracy still, oh wait, sorry. That was the question about that open letter from the Fu Future of Life Institute. I mean, it just got, it just came out this morning. Um, I read it right before uh, joining in on the webinar. Um, I think it's really interesting, especially based on everything that we're talking about and like how AI can kind of get out of control and hallucinate. So maybe we do need a moment to pause before we kind of understand the ethics and morality around all of this technology. Um, I don't know if you want to say more, Ryan. I, I have not read it yet. The fact that Elon Musk has signed it makes me skeptical uh, of of why of why it's happening. Um, I think I I, I I was sort of saying this before, but there are a lot of groups, both for and against AI, that have been waiting literally decades for this moment to play out, and they have all kinds of different 
okay. uh, uh, agendas. And so, yeah, I can't, I have to read this letter. I haven't read it yet. So I can't really specifically comment on this, but someone in the chat said it was uh, connected to effective altruism, which is uh, not my favorite group of people. So I don't know. Uh, I have to look more into it, but uh, yeah, the, the, the AI sort of larger macro debate is really complicated and it's only going to get like more complicated as, as this stuff gets more serious as an asset, I think. Um, question from Kate, accuracy still seems poor. Is there a way to limit the internet sources and AI uses for reference? There are. Um, so you should look into stable diffusion. It's an open source generative AI for images. And that's what that YouTube channel Corridor Crew used. So what they, what, what you effectively can do is you can, uh, basically connect parts of your AI library, your training set to a specific tag that you put in your prompts. That's how Corridor Crew did it. They, they sort of loaded in all these images from this anime they wanted to emulate, and then they tagged it that, and then they included that tag in their prompt to limit it to that art style. And it's not perfect um, because it's also using a massive amount of other stuff. Um, but you can, that's sort of why I was talking about earlier. Like, I think the new, the next push is going to be about limiting and making more specific and niche projects because uh, these things are just, they're too big and vast to be useful at a certain point. Um, we have time for one more question. Sorry, Alexander, but, you know, we'll check out Comfy UI. Um, um, but last question from David, uh, related to copyright and IP, what's your stance on surfacing, especially on work deliverables, what was generated by AI? Uh, it's complicated. I think right now uh, you should just say if a thing is AI, if it is. Um, and I think you just have to sort of get into your mind that what the AI has created can't be the, the final thing that goes out unless you don't mind not owning it, which could be true. I mean, the, it could just be that we create a lot of creative common stuff. But right now, this stuff, um, I think, works well as a, as a first draft. Um, and in fact, one of the best, I, I talked about this at our live event a couple of weeks ago. Uh, one of the best examples I've seen of this is the, an artist who drew backgrounds for a short animated film, fed those backgrounds into an AI, the AI cleaned it up, and then the human went in and cleaned that up. And I, I sort of liked that process. I, and they were they were pretty transparent about it. So that seems to be kind of what I would, seems to be what people are doing, um, but it's complicated. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your questions. I'm sorry there were some live questions that we missed because we were in that Q&A. So, Matthew, feel free to reach out um, and email us your questions. You can uh, email Mackenzie at pardonsum.com or myself, Layla, at pardonsum.com, or you can reach out to Ryan. Um, if you want us to do this for your business and workshop with you, also reach out. If you have more questions, reach out. Thank you, everybody, for coming out on Wednesday and hanging out with us to talk AI. This was really great. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks.